A very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the IFS, International Film School Cologne. My name is Nadia Radjevic, I'm the Chief Executive Director, and I'm delighted um, that more than uh, 300 people have signed up for this very special event tonight, and I think they're all coming in one after the other now. An event that combines two areas we as IFS are very fond of, serious storytelling and production design. Since 2013, IFS is offering the first and still the only master's program for serious storytelling in Europe. And since 2016, we are also offering a bachelor program in production design. Tonight, we are super, super thrilled to have Scott Frank with us, the showrunner of the hit show, The Queen's Gambit, as well as his partner in crime, Uli Hanisch, our dear professor for production design, and the man responsible for the amazing set design of the Queen's Gambit. Welcome to the two of you, great to have you here. And to make it even better, the talk will be moderated by an alumna of our series storytelling program. She's a writer from Paris, and as staff writer, she's written episodes of the acclaimed teen school, uh, show Scam and the teen sitcom Ask It, both for France Television. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the wonderful Elina Gaku Gomba. The floor is yours. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Nadia. Hello. Awesome. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Hi, Scott. Hi, Hello. Uli. So, um, our main topic tonight will be that in the Queen's Gambit, what fascinated me, what fascinated us all, is the character of Beth. She's amazing, she's fascinating, she's compelling. And tonight we're gonna to talk about how Uli's production design helped make Beth the great character that she is, okay? So before we start, Uli and, and Scott, I will briefly ask you to explain for our audience the role of showrunner and the role of production designer. Very shortly, so just so we're all on the same page and then we start off. Scott, you want to start? Um, yes, um, I, I, as I was really the writer and director and one of the producers. Um, I'm not sure I ever thought of myself as a as a showrunner because it was more of a, a limited series, and I thought we were really making one long movie. Um, but that's that's really what I did. I, I wrote all the episodes and then directed them, and was also one of the one of the producers. So that sort of was my role. And uh, well, the production designer is responsible to, uh, to, to be, say it very, be set up the, 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 the world of the story. So in, in, you know, in, in this case means to, uh, of course, come up with, a, with, an, with an idea, mood of the story, or the, we, we, then of course, everything, the stages and, and, and design for it. It's not in the costume and the makeup, which is different. Um, if there's a, like a set uh, department, uh, but of course there's a lot of conversation going on between departments. Okay, well, great. I think that's super clear for everyone. So let's start talking about Beth, this mysterious and compelling character. So this is the teaser of the show, right after the show starts. And we see right away that Beth is distressed and she's crossing this long hall. And right away, it tells us that the alliance between the set and the distressed character will be a signature of the show. So how did you two collaborate to make this scene happen? Scott, did you, did you know from the start that would be your teaser? Uli, what, what did you bring to make this scene happen? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, this is because this is, this is a triumph of production design. Um, this was always the teaser. Um, she woke up in a, hung over in a bathroom in a bathtub, fully clothed, um, right before this. So the, the design, um, what I was trying to do was establish you, you have no idea where you are. Um, you gradually realize you're in a very fancy hotel. She's woken up hungover, 
There are bottles in her room, um, drugs and so on. There's someone sleeping in the bed that she obviously had some sort of evening with. Then she races down the hall. She races into an elevator. She gets off the elevator. She races through a lobby, a hotel lobby and through a restaurant, through a glass door. And suddenly she's getting her picture taken and it's a chess tournament. And the idea was to establish two things at the top. One, this is not your father's chess show. Um, this is going to be a very different kind of thing. Um, and, and two, to establish that she, her character is, uh, we're going to, we're seeing her later in the, in the story and she is not in, in particularly good shape. And the conversations in the, in the script, what was different was we had her coming down a staircase but it was, it was slightly different geography. But what I needed was everything, her being late had to, had, you had to have it be difficult. In other words, she's got to keep going. And you know, when you're late and you have to run down a long hall and then you have to wait for the elevator, then you get on the elevator. And even, so every piece of production design is really interesting. If you start in the dark, there's that bathroom with that large brass tub. That's really interesting. That's the first piece of production design and you go, oh, she's waking up in a bathtub. And it's an amazing. And later you'll see the, 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 when she comes back in to answer the door, you see the mirror and you see the tub and you see, she gets up, the room is dark, but when she comes back in and opens the curtains, you see it's this beautiful hotel room. Again, somewhere glamorous, Paris is outside the window. Um, um, we set the time period, there's a, a title and then, she, um, you see the room is a mess. Also production design, very carefully art directed, just where the bed is and oriented toward everything. She then bolts out the door and we have this super long hallway <laughs> um, full of hotel rooms. She gets on the elevator, a new set, <laughs> you know, the elevator, which is a beautiful set in and of itself. And then we're joined where you started the clip where you see her running through each of those pieces for me, um, and it's what Uli does so well, they tell a story. You could watch without any sound most of this series and know what's happening simply from the visuals, simply from sometimes, you know, and so that for me is a huge part of, of the storytelling. Sorry, think, Uli. Uh, um, yeah, no, no. Um, um, I think what is my, almost more important than this being uh, the, the teaser or the trailer is that it's also the beginning of the story, right? So the whole story starts, you know, from the first second on. That's where we that's where we start uh, into the show without uh, having established any anybody or anything at all. So it kind of and of course, what I also like very much that that how dark the beginning of this bathroom in, in the room was. Um, so we have really no idea. I mean, like starting to watch this the series, we have an idea it's about uh, you know a young woman playing chess so we figure that it's her but even this we don't know exactly and then we we are kind of stumbling uh, you know alongside with her through the dark through this hallway elevator whatever and and everything is a bit dubious you don't know exactly what it is as as, as, as scott just said then running through the the the, the this kind of hotel lobby restaurant before we end up in front of that that door leading into the tournament. And I think that that was a very, you know, um, the idea I liked the most coming from Frank, uh, from Scott saying very clearly, um, we have to um, um, keep it the way that that we really have no hint of, of her uh, uh, running to a chess tournament. We just know or see her running through a whatever kind of elegant, you know, European or whatever kind of period place. And that is uh, that's a very interesting and and uh, deep kind of uh, storytelling from the beginning on, you know. And we had to make certain that we kind of set the level, set the tone, um, but we are jumping right into the story before we even start to explain it. And thinking about the character, like when Uli, you 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 designed this hotel lobby, what what kind of choices you made thinking? This will tell something about Beth. Like, well, the thing is that, of course, um, 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 there, there, there have always been two sides uh, of this world, uh, in, you know, within this, within the whole story. 
um, you on the, on the one hand you have what might be her own private world, which is relatively, you know, little because she, you know, then we, we learn that she 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 grows up in this terrible trailer with her obviously slightly crazy mom. Then after the accident, um, she comes to the orphanage. So so those are like her private places without being her private places, really. I mean, the, the trailer kind of was, but it still was very much the place of her mother. So the orphanage is not really her private place. And then the first time when she gets adopted, she enters the place of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wheatley to become her home. Again, it's not really you know her place from the beginning. And that's only the small part of her own life. And then when the story really starts, she starts to travel. So all those different hotels um, and, and, and tournament places you know, are the, the places where we meet her or where we accompany her but they're never really her places. That's the places where she gets to know about the world. So that was kind of the, the two sides of the, of the medal. Maybe Scott, you can maybe talk, add, add something to that. No, I think that's right. I mean, you and I had many conversations about every conversation we had. We, we, there was certainly an early conversations about the possible palette colors and so on. And, and Uli, you know, I, I tend to work, there's a, always a photograph or something that helps me know what the palette is. But beyond that, beyond the sort of um, aesthetic, you know, Uli was, was very focused on story. Anytime we scouted a location, anytime we looked at a location, anytime we looked at fabric, anything, it was about telling the story. It wasn't about um, simply being interesting to look at that taste yeah, or style or stuff like that, right? Yes, that obviously was going to be a part of it because we're making a visual, you know, story. So obviously it was going to be visually interesting in a very specific way, and we had that. But that's a separate conversation. First, you need to be in sync about what the story is and what the set, how the set is telling a story. Because remember, you only get two senses: you get sight and you get sound. So any, you're using everything at your disposal to tell the story. And Uli um, created, every time we were creating sets, um, it was about what is the story in this moment? And what will the story be in this section? And so on. So it all feels of a part. It's not just, wow, this looks great and this looks great. And they do all look great. But first and foremost, they're telling a story. And that's really important. So. To, to make it happen, to tell a story. How early on in the writing process did you two start collaborate? Maybe it came long when, when, when all, the, uh, all the scripts were green-lighted already or? No. How, really how, long have you been, how long have you been involved before we kind of started to, to get in touch in, it was something like October, November, I think, before, we, before the year we started? And how long have you been writing on or, or working on that already? I, I, I never knew that. Maybe six months. All right. But I'd been trying to do it for years before. I think six, seven months. I'd written one script only, the first one. Um, in fact, I believe I didn't give Uli the script. I don't think I was oh. finished with it yet. Oh. I was still writing it, yeah. actually. And we gave Uli the novel. Yeah. That was kind of interesting. So I got involved by get a, getting a call from Bill Horberg, the producer who was behind the whole show from I think from the from the from the beginning on also for over many years, I think. And he said, I have this I have this show um, and we are thinking to, to come to Europe because we have some European uh, you know places to be shot. And um, Scott Frank is directing and he's writing the scripts right now. Uh, but there is the novel. Can I send the novel to you? And can you read it? And can you, you know, tell me something about it? So I got the novel really, um, and reading it, and then we kind of made an appointment. Actually, I like the story very much, and so, so I said, what I usually do is um, I'm doing what we call a booklet. So I'm doing a kind of a picture, let's say, um, an images a reference book. In this case, you know, uh, it was of course about um, you know the USA in the '60s, but more important, um, it was all about things I, I wouldn't know. Maybe, for example, I never you know, had an, an image of an orphanage in the in the USA in the '60s before my eyes, so I had no idea really, right? And even more important, of course, all the chess tournaments. 
So we kind of uh, created this kind of, actually it was just something like a picture books of reference images about all different um, aspects. And then of course, from the, right from the novel, from all the hotels, uh, all kind of different uh, chess tournament rooms and places, um, realizing how uh, crazy and funny and, and weird they usually are. I mean, imagine, you know, a, a chess tournament in Kentucky in, in the 60s or something. You always have this, you know, the funniest places. In a way, they all look the same because you have a bunch of weirdos, you know, standing around uh, small tables and, and two guys or two people are playing chess. And then we learned how the difference, how different they could be. And that was the base, um, uh, I think, the, for the first uh, discussions we had, right, Scott? Yes, and, and um, one thing I should say, um, Alina, is that I, one reason I, I went to Uli was it was not really because we were gonna be shooting in Europe. I, there were two reasons I reached out to Uli. One, I was, and am, a huge fan of Babylon Berlin and the production design and the design was so amazing. It was both, it felt authentic to me, but it also felt unusual in ways that I couldn't quite put my finger on. And it was very singular, had a very strong point of view. So I really wanted to work with Uli. And um, I, I, wherever we were gonna shoot, I wanted Uli to be the production designer. Um, that was, was reason number one. When the other reason was I wanted, I was thinking about, you know, Milos Forman who made uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and other movies, European, the European point of view on America is frequently more interesting. Michael Apted when he did Coal Miner's Daughter, you know, these are real American stories done by, you know, uh, people who are not American. And I was curious to sort of pull it in a zone that felt somewhat different, you know? And I thought um, it was both Uli's sensibility as a designer and um, also the fact that he was coming at it from a place where he wasn't familiar. That was a strength for me, was that he had to kind of learn that and he would observe things and see things that I wouldn't see. Yeah, when you, uh, when you said that the first time I got really very, um, I, I almost nervous because I thought, what the heck? Um, you know, you, you were saying that in, in your kind of funny way, saying you, you know, buying a bunch of crazy Germans to do this all American story. I found that very interesting. And I think I'd like to add that maybe, um, and you know, what you, you know, what want to talk about specifically, I think to create the secret or the decision of how to create Beth's world was really, and I think we had these conversations really very early, beside the fact that that coming from the US to, to Berlin and doing almost everything here, um, is that we are doing a very specific story and we are not basically or mainly doing a period story, but a, well, we could almost call it a fairy tale or a fairy tale-ish kind of story. Okay. And, that, and that sets you in into another, almost in another dimension. And that makes every, or is able to, to enhance or change every kind of decision. So on the one hand, of course, you want to be accurate. And of course, you want to hit the 60s. And of course, you want to understand that now you are in Kentucky, now you are in Mexico City and Las Vegas and all that. But you can always, you know, take the whole thing and add another layer or another aspect or something. Um, to make it specifically her world. And I think that was the, that above all other, you know, sensations we, we faced was the, the biggest uh, and most important part and the, and, and, and the greatest part to do. Well, that, that's super interesting. And yeah, thinking about it a bit magically makes yes. a lot of sense in, in the show. And I guess one of the challenges uh, for you, Scott, and for you, really, was that Beth is a very internal character. She is, so she's mysterious, she's internal, she doesn't speak much. So I know as a writer, it's a challenge to, to make it external, to, 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 make, to show to the audience who she is. So, and I feel like the, the production design really helps because she's often visually in contrast with her environment. 
and maybe that's something you looked for. And I would like for us to watch a clip. Yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about this tournament where like the, the, the set is really plain, really simple compared to all the luxurious hotels, but it tells a lot of, about Beth. So Uli and Scott, how did you make this scene that looks quite simple, but probably is not at all simple to make? Well, this was the um, sort of first, it's not even a tournament, it's a, mm. what do you call that, like a simultaneous a simultaneous an exp an exposition kind of yes exactly at, at this at this um high school in her hometown and she comes up um was dragged in almost like a like a like a trained monkey or something like this pseudo super small girl um being you know, you know everybody's getting aware that she's a genius or something but it's the first time also for her to get the idea and i think um well i mean this was just something like a like a um like a big classroom and i think the our idea was also very simple to create the tables all you know to put them together like a big u shape um and have everybody sitting outside and she's on the inside uh, so she can go from one you know board to the other and of course it's like a little uh, you know so like a little arena and she's on her own in the middle and everybody is outside the players are sitting outside and then we, when we realized how big this, the location of this room was, that saying, okay, it's it, it's getting more and more uh, terrible for her. Also, at the same time, that more and more, you know, students would come in, and the room's getting fuller and fuller, and everybody's watching her. And I mean, she's like, she's like really tiny, uh, and she's not used to be in public at all anyway. Um, so it's like a, yeah, it's like it's like a battle arena. I think every tournament had this kind of headlines. Uh, or headline descriptions, really. And of course, this was to make it for her very, very uncomfortable and very mean almost. Um, and she is obviously, you know, she, she wins it all and she, she kills them all. You know, that's the triumph. And that's the fun, of course. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly, exactly right. All our conversations were how we make her look small. Um, it had to feel like an American classroom. And in fact, the, the shot, preceding this is the one where she's standing alone in the middle of the classroom and entering from behind camera come these young men who are going to play her and they block her out. <laughs> you can't see her anymore because they block her out. And, um, um, and then they all sit around her. She can't even look at them all at once. And so the design was always to keep her small, keep her separate, um, and keep in mind, it was being intercut with the scene in the basement, yeah. which was her sort of safe haven. And, you know, the kind of brightness in the classroom with this kind of dark yet warm feeling of the, of the basement, you know, intercut where she's now safe and eating chocolates. Yeah, and, that was nice. You know, um, um, you know, was, was sort of, that was also a contrast. So there are three Con there are two contrasts, major. One, her with the boys, and then the 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 contrast of the set between the um, basement and the and the high school. But you know, I want to add something because um, just for you, you know, to get an idea how how simple sometimes it is. Imagine the whole situation would be would have been the other way around. You had like a circle of tables, and the boys would have been sitting inside. You know. And she would have she would walk around them to play. You could do the same thing, right? But it would have a totally different feel and 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 meaning. So you know, I, I always try, uh, you know, in combination with what's the what's the idea behind it, behind the actual scene, um, um, to set up this kind of 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 um, how do you say that? Like a you know, like a board game. You know, it's yeah. it's 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 okay. setting up. A That's system. Great. It's like an architectural system saying, of course, we want to get her trapped. So we put her inside and everybody is around her. And as simple as it is, as effective it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, now we have to talk about the basement and the orphanage. I know, Scott, that you've talked about it in interviews a lot, but I think as viewers, we all had the same feeling of, oh my God, some awful, terrible, terrible things are gonna happen to her in this basement, in this orphanage. 
but no. And that was one of the really delicate delights of the show. And so I guess it was something you looked for, Scott. And Uli, you had, you had to work to make the orphanage feel both gloomy and very homey, very comfortable at the same time. So how did you guys work this out? Well, um, the, the basement and those scenes, if they don't work, the show doesn't work. Okay. It just doesn't work. So, so if they're not, you have to, that's where she, you know, learns everything, you know, that's like her time with Yoda. <laughs> and so you really need to, um, really need to, to be aware of, of, well, the design is everything because you want it to be scary. I want people to think that this, this, old man is going to do terrible things you want all of that to be sort of on people's minds because it's such a relief when it doesn't happen and the fact that your expectations are thwarted it makes it easier for you to now root for what's happening because you're surprised exactly you know? i think i think the the fun was really to to uh what you said before to 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 create this kind of contrast and we were kind of almost saying it this is a kind of a it's your hannibal lecter basement you know and you and again imagine you you go down in the basement you can also have a white tile clean room whatsoever i mean a basement is not it's not the same all the time you know it's exactly what you want it to be and of course here the 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 rule the rule or the idea was very easy saying you you go down here and you expect murder you know yeah <laughs> and then and then you get and then you have this this kind of first side creepy guy and you you, you still think murder and nothing else or worse um, and then it's the opposite right and that is of course that is that's that's storytelling and of course you need to have this kind of story that to create this, this, the, the set like this, right? And the rest of the orphanage was actually a bit more tricky um, because also what you said before, it has this mix, you know, it is, it's, it's a very stiff and um, formal place, but it's not a uh, Charles Dickens kind of nightmarish prison where they get, you know, hit and whatever really bad. So the people running this place are no monsters, they are, actually worse than monsters because they they believe they do right and they still fuck it up um and and i think also again um, what you said before this this contrast moments i think what was uh, um, helpful because of her character is that what we tried was that everything the whole world all the places they were always like too big for her you know it's in in even though they are great or fantastic by themselves, they stand for themselves. They're very, they're kind of vain, you know, and they're always too big for her and she, or she's too small or too little and she's always lost. So it's always, it, it was always about uh, getting or being intimidated, I think. And that's the design. If you look at the, the orphanage, you look, I mean, the basement is interesting because it's the darkest space in the show, yeah. but it's where she finds enlightenment you know, which which I think is great. And you're always on the make for those sorts of interesting juxtapositions. But the orphanage itself is is super imposing for her. And the the dormitory, everything, the rooms, the hallway in, you know, um, everything is designed to make her look less than, to look to look small. Even the the jar of pills is is extra long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everything makes her 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 look tiny. I think the I think the whole point of of, of the story is how um, what a extremely bad start she has in life anyway. She's a lost soul. She's a lost soul. I mean that's actually what you can say about her. And then she and she's entering the world uh, which is kind of too big for you know and that's the case for all of us i mean that's i think that's how, why we can connect to her so so easy because it's it's it we all have the same you know trouble when we start our life in a way it's just it's just worse for <laughs> you know and and um, and we wanted to create the world um hard 
uh, hard to, how do you say that, hard to enter, you know, and but she does, even though there's no, there's no chance or there seems to be no chance and she can still, she's, she's doing it because she has this talent, you know, and that's the, 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 right. the, the fantastic part about it. And talking about entering a world, uh, clearly one of the most amazing piece of production design is Alma's house. It's, it's insane. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's so at first, at first, it, it's, because of course, what's great is that the house evolves in time, just like Beth does. So that's great. But when she enters this home, uh, it's crazy. It's over the top. It's blue. And I don't know if you guys remember, but there's a huge curtain. When, when Beth first enters the home, she's literally at the center of a stage. That's something that looks nothing like her. And I, I was like, why? Why this theater stage, Scott? Was it your idea? Did it come from the production design or? The shot came from the design. I certainly never told Uli to design the house that way. Um, there were certain requirements we had, you know, where the piano had to be, you had to see it from the stairs because there were a lot of scenes that I had in my head. I wanted to have certain sight lines, you know, the, the stairs to the piano through the kitchen, you know, have a lengthwise, but this house, all I said to Uli was Douglas Cirque, that I was thinking <laughs> about the kind of hyper real suburbia of those movies and that it would be a reflection of the chaos kind of inside Alma's mind. But never in my wildest dreams did I think that he would be able to pull off this incredibly um, strange, loud environment that also somehow felt real, even comforting sometimes, as strange as it was. And so when she, when I saw the little curtains that he was doing, because we were going to have, we knew he had talked about them because we knew she was going to pull them down at some point, because we were trying to figure out how the house would transition. Mm. And in the script, it was slightly different. And Uli kind of was inventing different ways so that when she made it her own, what we could change and what we wouldn't change. There was a very complicated formula about paint and wallpaper and, you know, pictures on the walls and so on. But that proscenium, that stage, um, it's used twice in an important way for me, which is once when she first comes in. It's like her coming on stage for this new act of her. And, and when we saw that, we thought we have to do that. We have to use that because it's such a natural frame within a frame. It's also used when her father, her adoptive father leaves. The last time you see him is in the same frame, standing there looking at her saying, well, good luck. It's the same thing, only now it's him. She's sitting in the chair he was sitting in when she walked in the first time. And she's now sitting in that chair and he's, he's there in the frame. So- And, and uh, she's almost sending him out, right? That, yes. that's, that's the fun part behind, right? Bought the house from him. And, but they're literally have now reversed places. And um, in the same scene, there's also an interesting bit of, of camera where when she's talking to her father about buying the house and he, does, he wants to kick her out at first, they're both the same size in the frame. And then as she starts to call him pathetic, you know, we, we boom down on her so she gets bigger and we boom up on him so he gets smaller. <laughs> and it's very subtle, you know? So at the end of the scene, we're looking up at her like she's very powerful and looking down on him like he's, he's actually got no more power, power at all. Um, and then that's right before that, that scene we just shot. And it all works because of that wonderful environment that that Uli had had created. Yeah, the the, the house, of course. Um, I think that was the first thing we we started our our actual design process with because I usually like to have you know or come up with a, with a centerpiece kind of uh, you know uh, work for me to get an idea um, how to grip the whole the whole process. And of course, this is, it's the centerpiece of the story anyhow. I think that we had, you know, I don't know, nine or 10 shooting days in there or something like that. Um, um, and, but the funny, there were, there were certain fun, funny parts of it. 
But the funniest part for me was that we, when we started our research again, and we 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 got into all this kind of you know uh, material from from the U.S. from the '60s about you know your your perfect home and the all American dream kind of home, uh, and, and that that was the time you know of the of the of, that was the, the great time of doing this kind of thing, um, especially in the U.S. And we couldn't really believe what we found as, as research material. I mean, if you think this house is over the top, you should have seen our reference material. That's like, <laughs> that's like basic, you know, that's like lame, you know? And, and, and all the ideas of the wallpapers and especially also this kind of archway with the curtain and stuff like this, this is nothing we really invented. We just found that, you know, and it, in, in, like in every magazine, you know, it's a very, actually it's a very typical thing to be done at that time. Oh, wow. um, so it, in this case, it's, it's, it's of course about the research and it's uh, of course about stealing all the craziest ideas from those reference materials you can find and put them together. And um, so that was fun. Then of course, uh, because this was built on stage, maybe we have to, we have to get that information out. Uh, yes, yes. So yes. That, you know, we, we had like, like two or three hotel rooms were on stage, the, the planes were on stage and of course the Wheatley house. Um, so we were we had this kind of liberty you have when you when you design something you know on stage. So um, what I always like to do is to stretch architecture. So I take a floor plan, uh, and of course again you have a you have a kind of a typical way of of a structure for a floor plan of this kind of houses. They're actually pr pretty often very similar, but um, and then we took the liberty and stretch them all around in a way how we like them to be. So if you would see the, the floor plan, it's very bizarre. It has a very strange shape. And we do that uh, for several reasons, also to create an, an, a, a, a weird feeling here. We had everything very straight to the, to the street front. So again, it's this kind of, of, this, of this perfect facade kind of life, which is actually the headline for, uh, for Mrs. Wheatley for us was, to this kind of fake facade. So that, you know, have to create a fake facade was like our, our, our topic. And then you have everything straight you know, to, the, to the street front. And of course we had the exterior location in Toronto to match somehow, but the moment you get in, all the rooms start to twist and, 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 and make us you know, have a strange kind of shape. Um, and we do that also to get a, this kind of strange feel and of course to give um, the, the camera, I mean like the physical camera and the actors more possibilities. So we create, we look at, we kind of analyze all the, the, the scenes we can get from the script or any ideas we can get from the movement within the scenes and then try to not like go through it like in really tiniest details but see uh, what, what would ever happen there and then combine the rooms exactly through this or for these kind of purposes. Um, and then we see what, what's happening. And of course, you know, for on the other side, you know, I would never say that we were planning to have this archway with the curtain looking like a stage. That's something which just happens, you okay. know, to be honest. Well, great. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, Beth's relationship with Alma, which is a structural relationship throughout the super interesting, weird, loving at the same time. I love this scene. I think it's really emotional because it, it sets the bonds between the two and you see how Alma is afraid that she's gonna say no. And so I wanted to ask, why is a huge flight of stairs? Why did you choose to shoot this scene in this location? Well, um, I think, I don't know if you remember, Uli, but when we were scouting that location, we were walking around, it's a, it's a town hall or something, a, a city yeah. hall or something, but we were walking around looking for different things. And we, in the script, I think it was maybe in a hotel hallway or something, this scene, I don't remember where it was, in the door, by, outside their door or something uninteresting. And we walked up the stairs and I realized there was this gorgeous backlight that would silhouette them and would create a really interesting mood. 
And if they're walking up the stairs to this place, it's like they're arriving at some place. It felt to me like, oh, they're going to arrive at this really nice place. They're going to start at the bottom of the stairs where they were and end up at the top of the stairs at where they're going to start to go. And it just felt like this really nice backdrop. It felt much more interesting to have this conversation because it made it, it made it just more emotional just to have it to have all of this huge architecture acting on them and the light is a huge part of it too that silhouette is is really sweet you know on the on the two of them you don't know because you can't see their faces we're hearing them and you're not really sure how how beth is going to react and also yeah, the, think... the huge flight of stairs in, in the background gives a feeling of vertigo almost as if they could fall yes. They could well. fall right back down again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think that's another really very, very strong uh, example for this kind of uh, uh, collaboration um, is, you know, I mean, first of all, it's very, it's, it's very easy and technical. You, you need to find a location for this kind of hotel lobby whatsoever, right? Then you go out and you find something. This was one of our, one of our endless town hall locations we were scouting uh, here in Berlin. We have so many town halls, you know, however, it's crazy. So we, we, we went there and I think in the beginning when you, when you enter the, the, this town hall lobby, it doesn't really look like much, you know, it's kind of nice, it's kind of grand, however, um, and then, but we said, okay, it's the first hotel it's the, in Cincinnati, the Gibson, Gibson Hotel or something like that, um, however, and um, so we were we deciding, okay, let's do it here. And, and as Scott says, you know, you can you can find this kind of location, you can dress it up, uh, you can shoot there, and it can stay pretty lame, you know, if you don't use the put the, the the potentials you find there. Um, and you need, of course, you know, I can do whatever I like in in, in finding great locations. If if the DOP and uh, and the director don't play with it. You know, it's for nothing. You can even, you know, if, if you would see the location in front of your eyes, you would say, oh, well, whatever. You can shoot the scene here or there in this corner. It would, would have been a scene, you know? But in, then realizing those, those big stairs leading up um, and ending up there, I think, I, th I would almost suggest that how symbolic the whole the moment is that maybe even while shooting, you don't exactly get it you know totally it's just it, it just grows but you need to let it grow i think that's the fantastic part behind it you know that when i saw it because i think we talked about it but i wasn't really aware that you would do it like this when i saw the the the, the dailies of it i was like My, wow you know how great you know <laughs> so the sensations come either side yeah about another great set was of course uh the USSR, mm -hmm. which is super interesting because it comes also at the end of Beth's journey, where eventually she's clean and she wins and she's the best of the best of the best. And you have this really structured Russian architecture. So really was it a lot of research, but it's also a bit fairy tale as you said. Scott, uh, how do you imagine that? Well, it's a two-part answer. One, when we came to Berlin, I assumed we were going to have a hub somewhere and shoot all over the world a little bit. And Uli said to us, probably at the time very selfishly because he didn't want to leave, um, he said to us, we could do it all in Berlin. And we went, what? He goes, for the most part, you can do 90% of what you want in Berlin. And so we would be looking at buildings that either the interior could be anywhere like that Gibson hotel or the interior could be in America or the interior could be in Russia like the hall we're gonna talk about in a minute, the bear or whatever it is called. The yeah, hall. Zaya, yeah, however. There, you know, there is another building that when we walked in, it looked like Las Vegas. It just looked totally like <laughs> Las Vegas. That hotel is in Berlin. Um, the zoo looks like Mexico. The interior of that theater in Mitte is, is Mexico, the Mexico City Hotel. It's a theater and it looks like with the stained glass and, the, and we just kept 
checking things off. Originally, we were going to shoot for two weeks in Toronto to get certain exteriors and so on. And that shrunk way down to four or five days. And the the and so all of it we found, and we also knew that we could augment the um, these things with digital exterior work, with creating Russia, with creating digital backgrounds. Um, if we had this kind of building block, this this little building block that we could use to make it feel, and it works really well. I think with a couple of maybe minor exceptions. But the Russian hall was one of the very first things Uli took us to when we went on a pre-scout uh, uh, over Christmas that year. Um, we went to Germany just to see what was possible. And he showed us that hall and he showed us the Las Vegas hall. And I knew that I, I had to shoot in them no matter where we were, that they were gonna work great. Cause that Las Vegas piece felt like nothing I'd ever seen before. And the Russian hall had such a high ceiling and was so imposing and keeping with our theme of always making everything, you know, intimidating, it felt, it felt great. And we even went to Prague briefly to see what it would be like there to shoot. And we left early because it just, it was too much of, it was fairy tale-y. It just didn't feel, Berlin was destroyed in the war. So it's all post-war construction for the most part. And so it felt, it just felt like we could do whatever we wanted. We had Paris, we had every time I would, we had Kentucky, <laughs> we had the orphanage, you know, all of this was there. The trailer home was in, in Berlin, outside Berlin, the orphanage. And so things like the Russian hall was a no brainer. You, I couldn't wait, <laughs> to get there. I couldn't wait. And it gave me ideas, you know, the guys on the boards and it gave Uli zillions of, we, could, we, could, we couldn't stop thinking of things to do in this place to make it really extreme. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking exactly yeah, the, the, the very first time you came, I think we, we went there and to this Las Vegas location and I, I was thinking about an, something else, but I can't remember. However, I think, yes, exactly when, you know, the very first call from Bill saying we want to come over uh, to Europe for this show and then reading the novel and you realize that 80% or more plays in the US, if you, you know, count Mexico City, you know, including uh, the US. And so it was always just Paris and Moscow. And I thought, this is crazy, you know, I mean, this is so out of balance. Uh, um, you should do it the other way around, however. Um, but, but then when I read the, the, you know, the novel from, from, from this kind of perspective, I realized, of course, what you also said before about her being so internal is they would say, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence and we are not uh, getting or keeping her inside because we want to get cheap or, 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 or save the, the expenses to, to be outside. It is according to her character and according to her story, you know, she is she does actually she doesn't really care about the world in the beginning at all because she doesn't know it and she's and it's everything is so intimidating anyway and she needs to learn to to even realize that there is a world outside and that makes it so interesting and that's why we could really focus um on those you know those locations in berlin because we we just kind of just had to find all these various crazy you know event places to set up a, a chess tournament um, and again, uh, not only being very specific on in which city they would be, but again, being very specific what they mean for her. Mm -mm. So the Paris and the Mexico city, and especially, of course, the last one in Moscow, they have a very, very strong meaning, uh, what, you know, what kind of what's happening with her uh, uh, during the, the tournament. And that sets the tone because dealing with tacky Las Vegas is fun. Uh, having this kind of a little bit exotic Mexico City is fun. You know, doing the good old Soviet Union kind of bulkiness is fun, but it doesn't mean a thing if it doesn't mean yeah, yeah. something, right? And um, that was the, that was actually even more important. For example, in this, in, in, the, in the Soviet, uh, in, in the Moscow uh, place, we, we, of course, you have the, the hall by itself as it is with the high ceiling and it's all dark and gloomy and we called it like the, 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 the temple of doom that, you know, the temple of chess doom somehow and saying, how are we going to do it? So we set up everything 
uh, as uncomfortable for the players as possible. So we put them in the middle in a line, yeah. uh, put the audience on those on those steps, so th so they would be higher. And then we came up uh, with this with these towers, you know, for the demonstration boards. We learned that every bigger uh, chess tournament needs to have what they call the demonstration board, where people would have a bigger, you know, board uh, to set up, you know, what what how the how the, the the game is going, so that people could see it. And we created these like eight towers, you know, very high, like really like uh, I don't know, like control towers, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to it's you know, to be even more intimidating and con and controlling, and and uh, you can't do that without a reason. The only reason was again, like, uh, to make it really hard for her, to give her a really hard time. You know, that is the only uh, motivation behind it. And if you have this motivation, it's not so di difficult to get up, you know, to come up with this kind of ideas. Okay, well, th that's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh... If you want to add something or... Lovely to be here and and it's nice to talk. This was easily the nicest experience I've ever had even before it was released. And I thought the one I'd done before was the nicest experience I'd ever had. So there was a high bar. Um, and so it's, it's, it's lovely to talk about it. Yeah, and I want to uh, thank you again, Scott, for for uh, doing us the honor honor to join in here at the International Film School Cologne. Anytime um, to do that, uh, to do have that that panel and this this conversation. It's lovely to see you, you and too, I hope to see you again very soon. Yes, you will. I hope so. I can't <laughs> do it without you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Au revoir.